This is Focus with Jack Cottle. Good evening, I'm Jack Cottle. Welcome to this month's edition of Focus, talking about the flood in Rapid City of 1972, the 40th anniversary coming up next month right here in Rapid City. Three guests with us to talk about that. Jim Shaw, a former Rapid City mayor. He was working at KIMM Radio at the time of the flood of 72. Ed McLaughlin, another former Rapid City mayor. He was mayor during the 20th anniversary, remembrance of the flood. And Vern Shepard, he was working at KOTA Radio at the time of the flood. All three are members of the 40th anniversary of the Black Hills flood of 1972 committee. The date again was June 9th, 1972. Earlier there were warnings that potential flooding was going to happen around the area, but then it started to build. Reports of high water around the Black Hills. Canyon Lake Dam ruptured about 1045 that night. The crest of the flood reached downtown Rapid City about 1215. At the end, the final toll was devastating. 238 people killed, including five missing that were never found. More than 3,000 people hurt. 70, 770 homes. 565 mobile homes were destroyed, thousands more damaged, 36 businesses destroyed, along with 5,000 vehicles. We're going to start with Jim Shaw. Uh, obviously, a lot of thoughts about the flood coming up with the anniversary. How much over the years have you continued to think about the events of 1972? You know, in some ways, Jack, I think I probably think about the flood in some even minor way every day, simply because as you drive around Rapid City or you encounter people, think of things that have happened, somehow there's a trigger to the flood. That was a defining time in Rapid City. Obviously, very, very tragic. But it's uh, things before the flood and then things since the flood. I realize it's been 40 years, but in some ways it seems like just yesterday <coughs> you mentioned the 5,000 cars where the U.S. Post Office is now was an empty lot. They were preparing to build the post office and they cleared all the houses that formerly were there. So they used that space to pull all of these old cars, not necessarily old, but all of these damaged cars, and they were stacked up down there like a, a used car lot from you know, your <laughs> imagination. There were hundreds and hundreds of them, and people would go down and, and see if they could find theirs and such. I mean, that's just one image I have. So when I go to the post office, not every time, but sometimes, I think I remember that. That's just one of hundreds of memories that come out of the flood, but more importantly, and the reason we're doing the commemoration is for people who weren't here, weren't alive at the time of the flood, so they'll understand what happened, and most importantly, that as the experts have told us, something like that, maybe not as devastating, but something like that will occur sometime in the future. Uh, Head, how has that lived in your memories over the last 40 years, what you went through at that time? There were many activities and events that took place. I recall the the morning of the 10th, walking from my home uh, over on Rushmore Street and down through Bacon Park and finding a, a man and a woman in a Volkswagen that were, had drowned and reporting it to the National Guard and the police that were on duty at that hour, which was about 9.30 or 10 in the morning. Um, similar to what Jim has related, as you drive through the community, you recall what businesses used to be on such and such a location and now are no more. And, and then the decision that obviously was made by the city council and the mayor at that time to, to make a green way out of it and to recall all of the federal dollars that came in that made all this possible for the Greenway and the model for the uh, restoration of the community. And um, those are some of the things that I reflect on. Uh, Fern, how much have you thought about that over time, over those years? Not just now, but, but leading up to this. About every year, Jack, because uh, everybody has a story, or most everybody, and most of them are sad. Uh, we had just come back from vacation, and that night, we followed it, of course, from 6 o'clock on or 5 o'clock. And they said uh, at 10 or 10.30, 10.30, I think it was, uh, whoever was on, Bill Knudsen, I think, was on. on and he said, uh, it's pretty well settled down now, and the rain is stopping. And I turned the radio on. And that, at 10.30, they said the same thing. And I went to bed, and I didn't know about it till the middle of the night. But... The next morning, my golly, we had a car pull up in front of the house, 
and uh, our daughter had gone to the German band over at Stevens yep. Yep. that night. Larry Lytle had gone to that too. Larry had been at that. He was our council pres at that time. And uh, the, her boyfriend uh, took her home, and that's the last we thought of it. And in the morning, his folks had been away, and they came back and said, our house is gone. Where's our boy? And boy, that, that gets you. Uh, as it was, he crawled up on the roof like a lot of people did. Yeah. And he jumped into a, a tree, and he stayed there till about 4 o'clock in the morning. You could hear the water. You could hear the people. You could hear a screaming. One lady said, when the screaming stopped, we knew they were gone. And it was just a sad time. We went out the next morning to do some work at the radio station, Went out on Jackson Boulevard, and here was a doctor's big house over on Jackson Boulevard that was right in the middle of the street. And the house was gone, and the kids were safe, but uh, they were out in the street looking for their house and crying. Sad time. Now, reading uh, a lot of the accounts from that time, are some of those very, very chilling? I mean, you hear stories of the screaming, as you said, people mm -hmm. floating down streets that you can't reach. They've got no way to help. How traumatic was that? for the people that were here and, and went through that and saw some of that. It had to be awful traumatic for Mrs. Masters and Mr. Ron Masters mm -hmm. and his wife. They're on our committee. And they lost three sons. And their daughter, they didn't know she was alive until uh, she was in the back seat of the car with two brothers, or three actually, and one they didn't find for two weeks later, the little boy, about two. But she didn't know if they were alive or not. And pretty soon uh, the girl when the water went down, she said, uh, Dad, Mother, I can't think of the boys right offhand now, the names Jonathan and uh, Stephen, I think it was, they're gone, but uh, we don't know where the little boy is. And he had, she stayed, I have to show you how to do that. Air oh, pocket. Air, air. Yeah, just above the window. She kept the window open. And she could breathe, but the other kids couldn't. They were gone. And it was, you hear that day after day, don't you, with yeah, people? Mm -hmm. How tough were the stories that you heard from people and that you went through at that time? I think everyone that was here had a story to tell. It, uh, you know, there were people in, uh, moving from the uh, nursing homes and uh, mm -hmm. the water coming up and, and the police and the fire departments and the... Uh, propane tanks blowing up and and houses catching on fire with the gas mains breaking and so you had all of the explosions as well as the fires that were going on and drifting right down the 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 street and most of it it, it was almost like an avalanche there was so much debris of of wood and trailers and homes and lumber and logs and it wasn't just the high water it was the compounding effect of that whole motion of uh, like an avalanche coming right through the city how about you jim do you have some of those same kind of haunting kind of thoughts from that time like Vern said uh, earlier earlier in the evening on that friday night the report seemed to indicate that things were settling down a little bit I had been the announcer out of Black Hill Speedway even way back then, and we had called off the races that night because of the rain. So I'd gone home, and I was watching TV, kind of laying on the couch, and I guess I drifted off for a while. I woke up and remember hearing Rob DeWall on the news talking about potential high water. I think that was later uh, in the evening, 11, 11.30, something like that. And But still didn't give it much Credence, I lived over in Robbinsdale then, we had no serious flooding there, but about one or two o'clock in the morning, somebody banged on my door and woke me up, and it was a colleague from the radio station saying, Jim, wake up, wake up. The city has been almost swept away by the flood, and what's left is on fire because of all these propane yeah. tanks and other, other things. So we climbed in the car, there were two or three of us, and it was dark, Street lights were all out. It was still raining, and it was kind of an overcast, so it was just like out of a Sherlock Holmes novel or something as you drove around. We went down to the old city auditorium, which was located where the Dahl Fine Arts Center is now. That was kind of a temporary headquarters, and this is how they did things back then. 
we came up, we were all uh, young, healthy men. He said, okay, you guys get in the back of that pickup. We just jumped in somebody's pickup. Go help people if you can. And so away we went, just driving. We went out through West Main and out in that uh, direction. Uh, found two or three bodies. We didn't find anyone alive who wasn't already helped. But it was such an eerie sensation. And as time went along, of course, pretty soon the sun began to come up. And you looked over the city. It was, uh, it was fog, still cloudy. It wasn't raining then, but of course, water everywhere. And the unbelievable mess there was, just everywhere, as Ed said. The stench. The, the, the debris had clogged up under bridges and so backed up. So there were little mini floods, if you will, in certain areas where the water couldn't go any farther, so it flooded that neighborhood. It was, it was horrible. Quick story, about uh, two or three years ago, I was at a, an antique car show, and this fellow was so proud of his old car that he had, and he said, it's all original. My parents had this car. It even went through the flood and didn't get mm. damaged. And he opened the trunk, and that smell that I hadn't smelled in 35 <laughs> years involved me. That smell of the, the, the stench, as I'd called it, from the mud and the, the debris that was still in the back of that car. All right, we'll talk about the aftermath and the recovery from the flood of 72 when we come back with this month's edition of Focus. Good evening, I'm Jack Cottle. Welcome back to this month's edition of Focus, talking about the flood of 1972. Amazing devastation, and that means a lot, a lot of recovery and a lot of work to be done afterwards here in Rapid City. Thankfully, there were thousands of National Guard soldiers already in Rapid City for drills. Uh, Ed McLaughlin, a former Rapid City mayor during the 20th anniversary. How did this community come together for the recovery and, and all of that work that had to be done? I think very, very well. As I mentioned earlier, the federal dollars came in, made a major difference to this community. And during our uh, anniversary of, of 92, which was 20 years, uh, when we were planning the event, we found that about 40% of the people living in Rapid City at that time had not been here during the time of the flood. But we still measure time, similar to mm -hmm. what they do in the smaller schools around uh, when the, the basketball team went to state, why that's how they measure time before and after. Well, in Rapid City, it was before the flood mm -hmm. and since the flood. And one of the things that, that we uh, worked on was a program called Vision 2012, which we looked back at that time in 92 to see what had been transpired since the flood up to 92 and a plan for where we wanted to be in the next 20 years. So that was the defining mark and that's where the term 2012 comes from and that was how we kicked it off by looking forward as to the recovery uh, from the time of the flood to 92 and from 1992 on to the present uh, time. Okay. Vern, how did you see with the, the, the community coming together to, to get the work done that had to be done after this thing? You know, it was in June, and nobody, well, some probably did, but we had vacations coming up and people traveling. They wanted to stay there and get the job done. I know our family did. We didn't go anywhere. And the trucks were going up and down the hill over by Stevens there, taking the, the uh, logs out and the trees out. and. It was just a busy time, especially June and July, and then it tapered off a little bit. But you mentioned, I think Jim mentioned the National Guard. Yes. They did a great job. And I just penciled down a couple of things here. I'll forget somebody. You can <laughs> fill me in. But REACT and Ellsworth Air Force Base, the people out there, they had deaths in the guards. They had them from Ellsworth. The Salvation Army, we lost Bill Medley. His wife took over, and she ran the uh, Salvation Army for years. He was trying to rescue somebody, and I forget just where it was on the creek. But he was taken. Red Cross, Police Reserve. Can you think of anybody else, uh, Jim or Ed? Well, there, there were lots of groups, and some of them were almost ad hoc groups in the sense that mm -hmm. they were something else. It might be a Boy Scout group or a... 4-H group or whatever, and they would come forward occasionally, and not, not full-time, but as their time allotted, and they'd mm -hmm. say, we'll help serve food or sort clothing or whatever was needed. I, I think Vern 
uh, and Ed hit the nail on the head um, very well in saying, right from the very next morning, yeah. on June 10th, Saturday morning, there was no question that Rapid City was going to rebuild. Certainly yeah. there was tragedy, and we went through all the, the funerals of the people and, and all of that uh, in the weeks since, uh, following the, the night. But there was always the thought, people like Ron Stevenson, and, right. and uh, he just comes to mind, but he was a county commissioner at the time, but people who, uh, who just took the bull by the horns in the proverbial way and said, let's get this done. And the city council and the other government agencies just work so proactively to say, we're going to clean this up, we're going to make this town vital again, but ultimately they said, we're not going to make the same mistake again. It used to be kind of a, uh, st a status symbol to have a house on the creek, and if you had a deck that hung out over the creek, yeah, that was really, really top <laughs> yeah. Well, those days obviously are gone, and, and that's a, a testament to, you mentioned Larry Lytle, but others on the council too, mm -hmm. who took a lot of heat. Uh, it, was, it wasn't uh, without controversy, but they ultimately cleared that whole acreage that we now call the Greenway. How did this change the town, both physically and, and maybe the mindset? Of Rapid City. You know, one thing for sure, in the 70s there was a recession, not unlike what we've been through in the United States now. We didn't feel the effects here. It was almost like it didn't happen. Because there was so much rebuilding going on, uh, businesses were relocating, people obviously building new homes, uh, and all the other construction that had to go on. And that went on for years, not just that one summer. Uh, but more importantly, it let people, and with folks like Ed McLaughlin and others, when they had the 2012 program, put that in place, as he said, a look ahead. So it wasn't uh, maudlin saying, look at the tragedy. It, it was discussion of that. But look at the good that has come out of this terrible tragedy that happened. This was on the 20th anniversary. A lot of good things have happened in the community. What else would we like to see? What other things could happen? And we've continued along with that program for the last 20 years. All right, we have the 40th anniversary commemoration coming up. We'll take a look at that when we come back with this month's edition of Focus. Welcome back to this month's edition of Focus, talking about the Rapid City flood of 1972. Jim Shaw is a former Rapid City mayor and uh, working at Kim Radio at the time of the flood. Jim, is it important that the young people today keep these memories alive, that they know about the flood that happened? Absolutely imperative. Uh, for one reason, to honor and memorialize those who lost their lives and others who lost loved ones or their homes or their businesses. But more importantly, to remember that the force of this flood will occur again. We had a similar flood during the time I was, not a similar, but a flood during the time I was mayor. It was about a tenth of the water volume. But there was almost no damage because it just went through the greenway as it was intended to, as the high water was intended to do. Uh, over the years, there have been attempts to sell off parts of the Greenway or why don't we build a store over here or whatever. Uh, I would be totally opposed to doing any of that. First of all, as I said, because the Greenway in a way is a memorial. But secondly, it's a reminder that these things happen. And in a community like Rapid City, we've been through it once. Maybe you weren't here that day, but we went through it. We don't want to have anyone ever go through that kind of tragedy again. High water, that's one thing. But taking away buildings and obviously loss of life, we don't want that to ever occur again. Ed McLaughlin, another former Rapid City mayor. Do you think it's important to keep these things going? Absolutely. Uh, as Jim has indicated, the, the re rationale behind all of it is to not put businesses and, and people's lives in danger in the floodplain. And right now we have a beautiful greenway from the uh, fish hatchery all the way on down to the fairgrounds. And, and that whole area is designed to take a whole flow of water if it ever needs to be. And it may damage the golf course, but that's certainly repairable compared to um, what it happened in, in 72. And Vern Shepard was with KOTA, or KOTA Radio at the time of the flood. Uh, you're part of this 40th anniversary flood committee. So what do you guys have planned to try to remember this and to keep these ideas alive? We just happen to have that, don't we, fellas? <laughs> we do. Because <laughs> you've got the notes. So. Been, yeah, but we've been working on this thing since uh, back in the first part of the year or before. Mm -hmm. No, we've got a lot of good things coming up. 
Uh, just a minute, Jack. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't want to miss a thing on here. <laughs> I've always done my program. This is party line, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I believe this is that, a combination of that and the clock. That's show. the way we used to run that thing. Anyway, kind of, <laughs> you know. But no, uh, we're starting, uh, we planned three days. And uh, wind me up when you have to. Uh, three days. <laughs> And then we put it down to two. But all day Saturday, we got a lot of things planned. The chamber is going to have trolleys, I think, that uh, are going to take people out at 11 and 1 o'clock and the floodplain and other places around. But then we're, uh, throughout the day, we're going to have uh, tables set up as they want them in the arena. And you can bring in anything you want to do. I'm using my hands like <laughs> you think I was a weatherman. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> no, but you, you're going to have it set up. And if you want to put your, we'll have a name tag for them on there. And if they want to set up what the, what they have and they remember and sit and talk like we are here today with somebody that had a story to tell. That'll be all day. But that night we start at, uh, get these right now, doors open at 530. And then we have about maybe an hour of uh, music and slides and that sort of thing. And everybody's got some slides. And then the posting of the colors and the program starts. It'll go for about uh, two hours. Hopefully, <laughs> if we get Jim's little. running the time, so it'll uh, it'll be there. <laughs> it'll be there, but it's a it's a good thing. Jim is the MC for it that night. Okay. And uh, Ed and I are just staying in the background. I do have to give it. She's a got a major role. Two hundred and thirty-eight names, and we have to do that in a half an hour. And uh, we haven't timed that out yet <laughs> any better than I did my show. But <laughs> anyway, that's going to be that evening. It's going to be very effective. The next day, just quickly. At 1 o'clock, they have a flood memorial program. The municipal band that you hear at the uh, band concert will be there along with other people. Uh, better give somebody some credit here. We got uh, Caroline Brown, uh, Milo Winter, uh, the band people, and who did I forget? Larry Dalston. Larry Dalston. Larry's on it too, and Lynn Genoa. Lynn Genoa. And they will uh, put that all together, and they're going to have a ram's horn, a shofar, you know, a. Uh, uh, Let's see what else we got. Kent Millard is going to be there, one of the speakers. Kent was out at Canyon Lake at one time. Bill O'Connell, Lamont Sr., and the Mas Mrs. Masters will speak. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a good uh, two days. To, we're going to end it with uh, well, Don Barnett, who we haven't mentioned Don much mm -hmm. today, but he was a fire plug in this thing, and he remembered it. And if you ever want to talk to somebody about the disaster the next morning, these fellows know. But uh, Don Lived it. and... Uh, Ozzy Osheim and right. whoever else. They've got, they've got stories to tell. All right. Uh, I've got about 30 seconds left. Ed, what do you want people to take away from this program that you guys have? To remember that we've got to maintain the floodway in the future as people that come into the community may not realize the importance of keeping the floodway. All right. And again, the date of the program, Vern, is... 9th and 10th. 9th and 10th. 9th, the actual anniversary and 10th, the big day afterwards. And don't forget Boulder Canyon and all the rest that had water. All right. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you guys for all being here. Jim Shaw, Ed McLaughlin, and Vern Shepard. All again, the uh, Rapid City Flood Memorial coming up on June 9th and 10th here in Rapid City. And that will do it for us. Thanks for watching this month's edition of Focus. Hope to see you again right here the first Sunday night of next month. Good night.